To set the scene, we see Custer standing on his horse in front of his men, sword and revolver in hand. Ahead of him is a horde of Confederate cavalry, hell bent on crashing into the rear of the Union Army at Gettysburg. The only thing standing between victory and disaster is 600 raw recruits, armed with outdated pistols and sabers. The fate of American history rested in the hands of one 23-year-old general, George Armstrong Custer, who only months earlier was fired in disgrace. Despite being outnumbered and outgunned, Custer charged the flanking Confederates across an open field, yelling, come on you Wolverines, to his men. A desperate melee ensued with more than 200 cavalrymen killed, but Custer saved the Army of the Potomac from disaster and a star was born. When we think of Custer, images of ninth grade history class flash in our mind. We think of his last stand, the genocide of Native Americans, and the tragic conclusion of Manifest Destiny. We never think about his role in the Civil War. Before Custer's last stand, he was known for being the youngest general in American history who fought shoulder to shoulder with his men through thick and thin. His daring raids and charges gained worldwide fame. Journalists loved Custer and preferred interviewing him over full generals. Custer was the last of his kind, a member of a dying breed of soldiery. He was the last cavalier who preferred the fight with a sword over a gun. Welcome to Reviving History. This is the story of Custer in the Civil War, but before we get into it, make sure to like and subscribe. It really helps the channel grow. To begin, George Armstrong Custer was born in Ohio in 1839 to a lower middle class family. Custer's father struggled to put food on the table, but was able to give his son a decent education. Throughout Custer's childhood, the only thing he wanted to be was a soldier. In 1857, his family was able to get Custer a commission at West Point. At the academy, Custer suffered ruthless hazing from his upperclassmen and struggled to keep up with his studies. In his third year, his luck began to turn when the class of 1861 was ordered to report to duty by the behest of the War Department. Before graduating, Custer broke protocol and joined in a fist fight with his younger classmen instead of breaking it up, which was his duty. If the Civil War was not raging, he surely would have been expelled from the academy, but the War Department needed all the help they could get and the charges levied against him were dropped. Despite struggling academically, he survived the final battery of tests and got his commission. Custer arrived in Washington only days before the Battle of First Manassas and took up residence with his fellow classmates at a local hotel. At the hotel, he said goodbye to his Southern friends who were resigning their commissions to join the armies of the South. Custer reported to the War Department that evening and met Winfield Scott, who allowed him to pick where he wanted to serve. Custer got permission to serve under General McDowell as a staff officer and raced to join him in Northern Virginia with orders from Winfield Scott Custer joined McDowell at 3 in the morning on July 21st, only hours before the first major battle of the war. McDowell planned on attacking the Confederate left flank at dawn in a daring surprise attack, but he failed to achieve the element of surprise. His green troops and commanders struggled to get moving. After delivering Scott's orders, Custer was placed in the cavalry. Upon reaching the battlefield, the cavalry was placed in reserve. Because Manassas consisted of rolling hills and heavy woods, making cavalry essentially useless. The battle raged throughout the morning and into the afternoon. Custer spent most of the battle waiting behind a hill that shielded the cavalry from artillery fire. Inside the regiment, Custer was a mere lieutenant among veteran cavalry officers. The regiment was ordered to attack Confederate infantry, but upon reaching the crest of the hill, the attack was called off. For the rest of the battle, Custer was forced to witness the Union lose their first battle. The raw Union recruits collapsed under the fierce Confederate counterattacks. McDowell ordered the cavalry to fight a rear guard action to prevent this route from turning into a complete disaster with the Confederates marching all the way to Washington. Custer helped the retreat by participating in the rear guard. Custer then safely made it to Union lines 
exhausted after being in the saddle for more than 40 hours. After the battle, Custer was reassigned to the staff of Philip Kearney, a famous cavalry officer who lost his arm in the Mexican-American War and fought with the French in North Africa. He even earned the Legion of Honor. Kearney believed in strict leadership and daring raids. Custer later wrote, whether it was the attack of a picket post or the storming of the enemy's breastwork, Kearney was always to be found where the danger was greatest. During Custer's service with Kearney, he was tasked with raiding the Alexandria Line, a Confederate stronghold. Custer was tasked with advising Lieutenant Colonel Simon Buck of the 2nd New Jersey on how to properly raid, despite not having much combat experience himself. In the dead of night, Custer set out of 300 men from New Jersey and into Confederate lines. The raid failed. Buck and Custer were too inexperienced to conduct a raid, let alone a nighttime raid, and they were routed. After the disastrous raid, Custer left Kearney's staff, later claiming that it was because of a new War Department regulation saying that soldiers from the regular army could not serve on the staff of generals from the volunteer army. Because in the Civil War, the Union had two armies, the regular and the volunteer. And Custer claimed that the rules were that staffs could not mix or something, which was false. Custer left Kearney's staff due to an illness. Historians debate whether this was due to him catching a, low, a disease from the lowlands near the marshes of Washington, or if Custer caught an STD and left in shame. During Custer's time in D.C., he turned to drinking with his friends and started to neglect his duties until the Peninsula Campaign. George B. McClellan took command of the Union Army and renamed the Army of Volunteers to the Army of the Potomac. McClellan was a rising star within the Army. He was top of his class at West Point and fought in the Mexican War. In the 1850s, he left the army and worked as a railway engineer. Upon taking the command, McClellan planned on training the new army before attacking the Confederacy once more. For the rest of 1861, McClellan drilled his army. Officers and enlisted alike respected their new charismatic leader. They later nicknamed him the Young Napoleon. On paper, McClellan was the best man for the job, but his slow and timid nature proved fatal on the battlefield. Lincoln was frustrated with McClellan's set-piece nature and ordered him to attack in the early days of March. McClellan moved his army south and planned to have three armies converge on Richmond at once. In response, Johnston decided to retreat from Manassas. Custer fought in the cavalry pursuit, leading men into battle, sword and pistol in hand, at the Battle of Cedar Run. Custer said, when I got about halfway to the enemy, I ordered my men to draw their revolvers. I am taking place on the right and to the front of my company in order to be out of the way of their shots. We then took to the gallop and then to the charge. We crashed into the rebel line, but before we reached them, they broke and ran. We went after them as hard as we could go, chasing them a mile or two when they came to a deep ravine or creek, which they crossed by bridge and then tore up so that we would not follow them. Custer chased the Confederates across the river, but was met with heavy musket fire and decided to retreat. After the battle, he was hailed a hero and got interviews from the New York Times and the Philadelphia Inquirer. After the battle, Custer fought in the Peninsula Campaign and served on McClellan's staff as his eyes and ears within the cavalry. Unfortunately for Custer, the cavalry got bogged down in the thick mud and struggled to maneuver. Despite being bogged down, Custer still found a way to prove himself useful and volunteered for daily scouting missions. After the Battle of Williamsburg, Custer found his old friend, John Lee, tangled amongst the Confederate dead. Lee was still alive and was brought to safety. Custer recalled years later that a classmate of mine was a captain of one of the rebel regiments and was taken prisoner after being badly wounded in the leg. I took care of him and fed him for two days, but then had to leave him when I went on with the army while he would be sent north. When we first saw each other, he shed tears and threw his arms around my neck. And we talked of old times and asked each other hundreds of questions about classmates on opposing sides of the contest. I carried his meals to him, gave him stockings of which he stood in need and some money. This he did not want to take but I forced it on him. He burst into tears and said it was more than what he could stand. He insisted on writing in my notebook that if I ever should be taken prisoner, 
He wanted me to be treated as he had been. His last words to me were, God bless you. By the way, Custer tend to over-exaggerate. Fighting was constant. Custer wrote home that there is scarcely 10 minutes when we are not fighting with the rebels. McClellan reached Yorktown and put in under siege. Instead of storming the fortifications outright, he brought naval guns to Yorktown and planned on pounding the defenses to oblivion. Bringing up the naval guns gave Johnson vital time to bring in 47,000 reinforcements from different regions to face against the young Napoleon. During the siege of Yorktown, Custer served as an aide to General Smith and helped conduct reconnaissance with Professor Lowe, who brought seven hot air balloons to the peninsula. Later on, Custer led an attack with four companies of infantry across the Chickahogamy River and captured 50 Confederate prisoners along with a battle flag. As a reward, McClellan made him his aide on his staff and promoted him to the rank of captain. While serving on McClellan's staff, he saw incompetence firsthand. Despite having almost total superiority, McClellan was operating with false intelligence and believed that there was more than 90,000 Confederates guarding Richmond. Johnson got wounded during one heated battle, and Robert E. Lee took command and went on the offensive. McClellan thought his suspicions were confirmed, refusing to believe that a weaker army would attack, numerically superior one, and retreated. Custer once again helped save the army from disaster. He helped the Union Army withdraw to their ships and retreated. After the loss of Marvin Hill, Custer was ordered to counterattack and try to retake the hill, but that attack ended in failure. The Confederates were able to rain down artillery on the oncoming Union cavalry and infantry. Before the Union departed, Custer visited Lee several times and took a photo with James Washington, an aide on Johnson's staff. The photo would be shared worldwide and remain one of the most iconic Civil War photos. Upon McClellan's return, he was sacked and replaced with John Pope, but Pope lost a series of battles against Lee and Stonewall Jackson, so Lincoln decided to fire him and reinstate McClellan. After Custer's return from the peninsula, he lingered around Washington for a few weeks before rejoining McClellan on the battlefield for the Maryland campaign. Custer served in the 1st Cavalry, he participated in a devastating cavalry charge during the Battle of South Mountain. He later wrote to McClellan, stating that he took more than 300 prisoners. A couple days later, he witnessed the Battle of Antietam, but did not take part in the fighting and spent the battle working on McClellan's staff, dispatching orders. After the battle, he joined the 8th Illinois Cavalry in pursuit of the retreating Confederates and captured several cannons. After the Battle of Antietam, Lincoln decided to fire McClellan once and for all. Everyone within McClellan's staff was sent home to await orders that would never come. Custer was demoted to the first lieutenant and sent to serve in the Michigan Regiment. Before rejoining, he went home to visit his family and returned to the front on December 17th, only days before Christmas. Custer left his hometown in shame after failing to win the love of Elizabeth Fagan. Custer returned to Washington only days after the disastrous Battle of Fredericksburg and found the city in chaos. Custer briefly visited the War Department in hopes of gaining some orders but received none, so he returned home and spent the winter trying to regain the affection of Elizabeth. In May, he returned to the front but was reassigned to New York as an aide to McClellan, who was living in Manhattan. McClellan was planning on joining the political arena and needed help creating a defense for his military blunders. Custer was happy to help and enjoyed pouring through old letters and dispatches. He enjoyed the workload and the short hours, but he knew his military career was in trouble. He needed to return to the war and somehow climb up the ranks once more. Custer decided to join the Army of Volunteers, knowing that his military education would propel him up the ranks. Luckily, Custer had some friends from West Point who were in high places within the War Department. They got him a spot as an aide to Vet Lieutenant Colonel Alfred Pleasanton. Custer then took part in a few raids, destroying Confederate supply lines. In May of 1863, Custer was ordered to screen Lee's movements and counter raids launched by Jeb Stuart. Custer proved himself indispensable to Pleasanton, who was a desk general at heart and needed a man with battlefield experience to lead in the field. Custer later wrote on how much Pleasanton admired him. I do not believe a father could love a son more than Pleasanton loves me. Custer had become del facto general on the battlefield, and the men trusted and respected him. 
During the early months of 1863, Custer took under his wing a homeless man named Johnny Sisko. Sisko served as Custer's aide and did his laundry and cooked his meals for him in exchange for food and shelter. Sisko earned Custer's respect and rode beside him through thick and thin. Custer later wrote that Sisko would rather starve than see me go hungry. I have dressed him in soldier's clothes and he rides one of my horses on the march. On the march, Pleasanton discovered the location of Stewart's cavalry and moved to engage. Poor intelligence failed to warn Pleasanton that Longstreet's and Ewell's corps were in the vicinity. The Battle of Second Brandy Station began with the Confederates surprising the scattered Union cavalry. When the attack began, Custer lost control of his horse, who was new to war, and took off in the other direction. Eventually, he gained control of his horse and joined the fray for more than 12 consecutive hours. Both sides suffered heavy casualties, and the battle ended in a stalemate with Longstreet and Ewell's corps arriving in force. In late June, Pleasanton made his way to the Blue Ridge Mountains and fought Stuart once more. Custer once again led from the front and fought off the Confederate onslaught. After the battle, Pleasanton was promoted to Major General by Meade, who took command of the Army of the Potomac. Meade then promoted Custer to Brigadier General only days after the Battle of Gettysburg. Upon taking command, Custer set off in search of Jeb Stuart, who detached from Lee's army and started raiding up north. Under Custer's command, he had the 1st, 5th, 6th, and 7th Michigan Cavalry. Custer smashed into Stuart at Hanover, Pennsylvania, but Stuart retreated shortly after the fight on July 2nd. Custer led the pursuit and ran into Hampton Wade at Hunterston at 4.30, who was escorting a captured Union supply train. The fighting was once again short and brutal, but Custer came out victorious. Stuart's cavalry unintentionally lured Custer to Gettysburg. On the afternoon of the 3rd, Custer reached Gettysburg just in time for the epic conclusion of the Battle of Gettysburg. Pickett's Charge. During Pickett's Charge, Stewart launched a flanking maneuver in an attempt to get behind Meade's lines. Custer saw the flanking Confederates and charged into the advancing cavalry and supporting infantry, yelling, come on, you Wolverines. The cavalry had were the 7th Michigan Cavalry, which was made mostly of raw recruits. Due to weapon shortages, the 7th only had sabers and outdated pistols. Despite lacking the best weaponry, Custer was able to drive the flanking Confederates back. Stuart was beaten, but not out of the fight. After the initial charge, he sent Hampton out once again to scout the Union lines and await for a counterattack. Hampton was overextended and faced the ire of Custer, who took his most experienced division, the 1st Michigan, and charged into Hampton's line. During the melee, Custer got his horse shot out from under him and had to fight his way to another horse, sword and revolver once again in hand. Custer was able to fight Hampton to a standstill and save the Union Army from disaster. A soldier later wrote, The charge of the 1st Michigan, led by Custer himself, was the finest thing I had witnessed during nearly three years of war. 219 of Custer's men died in the fighting. After the battle, Custer led the pursuit and attacked exposed elements of Lee's supply train in some of the bloodiest, most devastating battles of the war. Custer's men had the upper hand because the Confederate army was on the verge of exhaustion from weeks of endless marching and fighting. Custer's regiment was now equipped with lever-action rifles, which gave them a distinct advantage over the Confederates, who were poorly armed at the best of times. His cavalry captured several hundred straggling Confederate soldiers, and dozens of wagons, and even several cannons. Lee fought his way down South Mountain and through the Cumberland Valley, all the way back to Virginia. During one particularly bloody skirmish, Custer took shrapnel to the thigh. One soldier observed, The whole cavalry had massed and ordered the cross the Rappahammock. Then General Pleasanton ordered an advance, and in a few moments, quite as if by magic, the whole country was alive with horsemen. First came columns of skirmishers, who immediately deployed and went forward, at a brisk trot, making a connected line as far as the eye could see. This was a handsome charge and it was led by General Custer, who had his horse shot out from under him once more. This officer is one of the funniest looking beings you would ever see. He was like a circus rider gone mad. After the battle, Custer got a month off the nurse's wounds. Upon his return to the army, he led from the front in a couple daring raids and helped train raw recruits during the winter of 1864. Custer took part 
in Hugh Kilpatrick's famed Richmond raid, serving as a diversion to distract Confederate forces while Kilpatrick's renowned Kill Calvary stormed the city. Kilpatrick planned on freeing the Confederate prisons, which were filled with Union prisoners, and he wanted to take Richmond outright. The Raiders failed to take the city, but they shook the Confederates to their foundation. It was an ominous omen to the Confederates that their defeat was inevitable. Pilsington was sacked midwinter by President Lincoln, and Philip Sheridan took command of the cavalry on the behest of Ulysses S. Grant, who took command of all Union forces. Grant quickly reorganized the Army of the Potomac and unleashed it upon Lee. Sheridan was one of Grant's best commanders out west. He planned on detaching from Grant's army and breaking away from the tradition of using Union cavalry as a support role. After the disastrous battle of the wilderness, Sheridan left with all of Grant's cavalry to hunt down and kill Jeb Stuart. Custer was at first afraid of Sheridan, believing that he would fire him due to his close ties to Pleasanton. But as one aide would later put it, during all of General Sheridan's brilliant successes in the Shenandoah Valley, Custer was among his favorite captains of the horse, bold, dashing, and daring. Custer was always chosen to head cavalry expeditions of unusual hazard or difficulty. His notable courage and imperitude always succeeded in confusing the enemy and winning successes to the national cause. He always led his column in person and never wanted a soldier to go with him who would not hesitate for a moment to ride straight up on the rebel army if ordered. Custer fought in the confusing battle of the wilderness, which turned out to be one of the bloodiest battles of the war. That's a broken record at this point. They all were extremely bloody. <laughs> the wilderness was a dense forest in Northern Virginia where Lee placed his army during the winter of 1863. Lee used the dense forest as a shield against the Union cavalry. Despite being caught off guard, Custer made a valiant stand and defended his position of the Union line by having his men dismount and use their lever action rifles. Grant later wrote in his memoirs that Sheridan is entitled to the credit of placing Custer where he was, but that is all. Sheridan was not on the ground to direct the attack in any way, nor was the division commander on the ground. It was Custer's attack and it was Custer's victory. After the Battle of the Wilderness, Sheridan marched straight towards Richmond to force Stuart to engage him. Stuart attacked despite being outnumbered and outgunned in a desperate battle for Yellow Tavern. Stuart was killed at the height of the fighting, which effectively ended Confederate cavalry supremacy. This gave the North free range to destroy Confederate supply. After the battle, Sheridan kept moving south, ripping up railway lines and torching supply hubs. Custer raced to Beaver Dam Station before Confederate troops could defend it and set the station ablaze. Custer also destroyed vital grain en route to Spotsylvania Courthouse. Sheridan returned to Grant a hero, and Custer was his right-hand man. Upon Sheridan's return, he raced to the strategic crossroads of Gold Harbor and set up defensive positions. Hampton tried to drive Sheridan back, but Custer's cavalry was able to hold out for several hours till Union infantry arrived in force. Once again, lever-action rifles ruled the day and prevented the South from getting the upper hand. A soldier later wrote, Ammunition boxes were distributed on the ground by the side of the men so they could load and fire with great rapidity. Interesting word. On June 25th, Custer was ambushed at Trevilian Station. Historians would later call this Custer's first last stand. Despite being surrounded, he managed to fight his way out of the encirclement. A month later, Custer joined Sheridan in the Shenandoah Valley. During the march, Custer was ambushed by Fitzhugh Lee's cavalry at what would later be known as the Battle of Port Royal. Custer managed to fight off the Confederates and captured several hundred prisoners. Sheridan fought his way down the valley and used the same brutal methods that he used in Northern Virginia during the Overland Campaign. At the Battle of Winchester, Sheridan shattered Jubal Early's army. In several decisive battles, Sheridan managed to gain control of the Shenandoah Valley. Custer played a pivotal role in that campaign by raiding supply lines and crashing into the enemy's flank during one of Sheridan's famed battles. For his effort, he was promoted to Brevet Brigadier General, thus giving him a second star. In 1865, Custer fought the remnants of the Confederate Army and accepted the surrender of hundreds of Confederate prisoners, leaving the Army of Northern Virginia en masse. Sheridan led his army out of the valley and attacked Lee's retreating army at Appomattox, capturing vital Confederate supply once more. 
Afterwards, Custer took part in the surrender of Lee's army at Appomattox Courthouse. As a gift from Sheridan, he received the table Lee and Grant signed the surrender on. Custer ended the war as one of the most popular generals of the Union Army, right up there with Grant and Sherman.